Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the fight P4S Part 2. This is the second half of the Hesperos fight. If you've cleared the door boss in time for the rest of your instance timer, you are treated to this fight. Let's break down all the major mechanics and hopefully help you go for the clear. First, some positions. In a mechanic called Act 1, there's going to be set tower positions in these locations. You can have either player, every player be assigned to a specific tower, or you can do these relative to a specific cardinal. In a mechanic Act 3, you're going to need one melee slash tank and one healer slash range to be a designated baiter who's going to go further out than the rest of the group. You need to have tower positions. Be aware that depending on how the mechanic goes, these might be mirrored. And you need spread positions around the boss for the three players in each group who are not baiting. Finally, in a mechanic finale, you need to have spread positions that are going to be relative to a thorn in the ground. You should have your tanks and healers be in one group and all of your DPS in the other and have designated spread positions around your thorn. These can be the same relative to the safe spot positions that you used for Act 1 if you're going for a safe spot relative strat. There are two raid wides in this fight. Searing Stream hits quite hard and will require at least a little bit of mitigation depending on your gear. And Ultimate Impulse is an even harder hitting raid wide that will require significant mi mitigation. There are in fact four tank busters in this fight. Near Sight will target the two nearest players to the boss and hit them with a spread uh, cleaving AoE. To deal with this, have your two tanks spread to inside the hitbox, to opposite sides of the boss, and make sure every other player is outside of the hitbox. Far side is the exact opposite, targeting the two furthest players from the boss. Just have your tanks go max melee so they can keep up time while everybody else stacks in a opposite cardinal direction. Demigod Double is the same tank buster from P2S. This is a shared tank buster. You can either have one tank take it with an invuln, and since there are only two of these, you can have both of these be dealt with with invuln during the entire fight. Or you can have both tanks pop cooldowns and share it. The final tank buster is Heart Stake. This is a double hit tank buster. The first hit will always target the first player in aggro, likely your current tank, with a really hard hitting tank buster that also applies a spicy debuff, bleed debuff. Immediately afterwards, the second player in aggro is also targeted with a tank buster and given the same spicy bleed debuff. Now, if you have your tanks as your first and second in aggro, they can simply pop cooldowns and it will naturally target each of them separately. If instead, you would prefer to have that bleed on just one tank, have that first tank pop lots of cooldowns and prepare to help mitigate and heal them through two really hard hits, and have your off tank provoked during the cast bar. If that happens, the bleed will only be on one tank, and you might find this a little bit easier to heal up afterwards. The fight begins with Searing Stream. Immediately afterwards, the boss casts Akanthai Act 1, and you're going to see eight towers and four AoEs. None of these go off immediately. Instead, the boss places thorns down, with each thorn representing one of those mechanics. Wait for a Searing Stream that you need to heal up for, and then the boss will cast Wreath of Thorns and immediately tether to two of the AoE Thorns. These are going to be the first mechanic to go off. As a result, because East and West are tethered, we know that the initial safe spots will be North-South. Then the Towers are tethered, and finally, the other two AoEs. Here's what this means. This is the order of mechanics. First, the two AoEs tethered first, then all eight Towers need to be soaked, and finally, the last two AoEs. With player movement, it should look like this. Dodge the initial AoEs, move into the towers to soak them, and finally move to the final safe spots to dodge the final AoEs. Immediately afterwards, the boss will cast either near sight or far sight, so have your group move either in or out of the hitbox to be able to take this. Next up is Akanthai Act 2, and this time we get four towers and four AoEs. Their locations are always around north and south. If you're using the waymarks I have in this fight, just to show them better, the letters are always going to represent the towers, and the numbers are always going to be your AoEs. Wait for a demigod double to go off, 
have either your tank in Volnus or have your two tanks share it. And then the boss is going to cast Wreath of Thorns and Act 2 will commence. The boss will always start by tethering two of the AoEs and two of the towers. Focus on the letter waymarks tethered. Those are your initial safe spots as those are going to be away from the AoEs. This is telling us this pattern here that north south of the first safe spots and afterwards we'll dodge to east west. This is very similar to an Act 1. The second set of AoEs and towers are tethered. And then, just to give you a rough idea, this is the size of the AoEs. There is room for melees to try to get uptime during this mechanic, but it is a little bit risky, so you might need to discuss with your group and start to get the feel for the size of the AoEs. Finally, as the cast of Wreath of Thorns finishes, tethers appear. Every tank will be tethered to a healer. Every DPS will be tethered to another DPS. When you stretch these tethers far enough, they break, and a mechanic happens, depending on the orbs above their head. One tank and one healer are going to have dark orbs. When they stretch these tethers, it lets off a massive raid-wide that hits everybody, and also gives them a magic vuln up, meaning that they can't take damage from other sources and for the next three seconds, otherwise it's likely to kill them. We're going to try to break these almost immediately. Two DPS are going to have arrow orbs. If the tethers get stretched, you get a twister-style knockback that's almost certainly going to kill people. Don't stretch these tethers. Instead, the debuff will naturally fall off as long as these two players stay together for the entire mechanic. Finally, the last tank healer and DPS pair are going to have fire orbs. When you stretch these tethers, that player, or each player in the tether, is going to get targeted with a little mini party stack. You want to make sure that there's two other players stacked with them, ready to make sure that they can soak the damage. Now that we know where we are, we have our tank and our healer with the purple orbs immediately go out to the ori original safe spots. Our tank always goes north or west, our healer south or east. They stretch their tether, which lets off a raid wide, which we can heal up no problem. At the same time, the boss casts dark design and puddles appear. We've had the entire group stack middle so that we can dodge the puddles easily. The tank and healer who have gone out are about to soak a tower, so they've deliberately dropped these not on the tower so that they can then move over onto their tower. Now, as we dodge the puddles, we're starting to break into our first set of light parties. Our tank with fire heads towards the other tank. Our healer with fire heads towards the other healer. Have the DPS with fire go towards one and the DPS with arrows go towards the other, and you've got easy groups of three. Wait for the puddles to disappear, and then have them go all the way out to stretch the first fire tether between tank and healer. You're going to have the AoEs and the towers for the first set go off. About the same time, this tether breaks and our light party stacks get soaked. Now, we need to rotate to east-west, but again, very carefully. Our tank and healer and towers just rotate clockwise to the next tower. The tank and healer who just broke their tether, tank rotates clockwise, but the healer rotates counterclockwise. Two reasons. One, we need them together. And two, we would much prefer to have our healers opposite each other so that they can more easily heal up the entire party. Have your DPS with arrow rotate clockwise. And your DPS with fire need to rotate opposite directions to break their tether. I recommend having a priority system in place to determine who rotates where, with your four DPS knowing who's most likely to go clockwise, who's most likely to go counterclockwise. In this case, M2 is priority for clockwise, so they rotate clockwise and the other DPS rotates counterclockwise. The second set of towers and AoEs go off at the same time the tether gets ready to break, and we take our second set of light party stacks. At this time, the arrow debuffs should fall off, and as long as your two DPS stayed near to each other, nobody will have died from them. Immediately rush into middle and get healed up and mitigate, ready for a really hard-hitting ultimate impulse. Afterwards, the boss casts Akinthai Act 3. This time we get eight towers and a knockback centered in middle. Don't worry about the knockback. We're going to immune that, but the towers we need to deal with. When the boss cast finishes, thorns fall down, representing each of the towers, and we immediately get wreath of thorns. Four of the towers on one side are all going to be tethered first. Whoever, uh, whichever side is tethered first, have your healers in range to get ready to take those towers. The boss will then show that the knockback's going to happen next, but we're just going to immune that. And finally, the boss will tether the last four towers. These are going to be for the melees and the tanks. As the cast finishes, get ready to have everybody in the hitbox and your melee baiter, in this case main tank, 
be out far enough for Cthornis Kick. This targets the furthest player with the boss jumping onto them. You need to make sure that they're not so near that they cleave anybody else because this will hit with a small AoE around the boss. This gives the tank, who was just targeted, a physical vuln up, which means that they cannot take one of the uh, Earthshaker-style protein waves that are about to hit off. What needs to happen now? The healers in range need to go into their towers. The melees and the other tank need to position as the three closest players to the boss, ready for their spread sort of cone AoEs. It looks like this. The towers and the cones are going to go off at about the same time. Right now, pop your knockback immunity. That'll allow you to ignore the knockback. Towers go off and the cones hit the three players. And the knockback's completely ignored. Immediately after this, all of your tanks and melees need to go into their tower set. And your healer baiter needs to get into position. They're the furthest player away, so the boss is going to jump onto H1 as the towers hit. And now lastly, have that baiter move into the middle, and have the other three healer ranged spread around the boss, ready to bait the protein wave cleaves. Afterwards, I recommend immediately having your whole group stack sort of near mid around the boss, and having your tanks go to either side. This is because the boss immediately casts either near sight or far sight, and you want to minimize movement. Once this is dealt with, use this as a chance to pull the boss middle as you have a few autos before heart stick hits. Again, you can either have one tank take both hits with a lot of cooldowns and some healing in between so that there's only one bleed debuff to deal with, or just make sure your tanks are first and second in aggro so they take both hits, one each. Afterwards, the boss casts Akanthai Act 4, and we get four more towers and four more AoEs. When the cast finishes, they're replaced with Thorns, we get a Searing Stream raid-wide to heal up with, and then the boss cast Wreath of Thorns. Now, instead of tethering any of these towers, the boss is going to tether the thorns to the players. Every player is going to be tethered to one thorn, and every player is going to have either a dark orb above their head, that means they're tethered to an AoE, or a light orb above their head, that means they're tethered to a tower. Here's what this means. If a player with a light orb above their head stretches their tether and breaks it by getting too far away. This will has, cause two things to happen. First, the tower they're tethered to is triggered, so someone needs to be in it to soak it. Secondly, their light orb means that they're going to have a point-blank AoE on them. If somebody with a dark orb stretches their tether, once again, two things. The AoE that their thorn is representing will explode, and they'll also let off a raid-wide with a magical Voln debuff. It's very important that none of the purple orb tethers are pop, broken prematurely, otherwise you're likely going to kill several people. Stay middle, but find the tower that you're, the thorn you're tethered to, and heal up for a searing stream. And afterwards, prepare to go to your next position. If you have a purple orb, rotate one position clockwise. This puts you ready to soak a tower, and also make sure that you are not going to stretch your tether and cause it to pop early. If you have a white orb, you want to rotate three positions. This will make sure that you're not on a tower, so you're far away from everybody else when your point-blank AoE goes off, but also will mean that your tether stretches, and you'll immediately cause all four of the towers to get triggered. It will look like this if you're doing it correctly. This leaves just the purple tethers to break, and we're going to break these one at a time, making sure that no one's near the thorn that's being AoE'd at that time. So agree on a cardinal, say north, have whichever player is tethered opposite it go all the way out to stretch their tether. And everybody should naturally be dodging the south AoE as we heal up through the raid wide. Wait till the magic Voln debuff falls off and rotate to your next direction. As long as you keep healing and make sure you're not too near to the thorn being exploded, you should be fine to survive through this. Afterwards, get middle, heal up through an ultimate impulse, lots of mitigation, but not too much because you then have Searing Stream immediately afterwards to heal through. Lastly, Akanthai Finale. Akanthai Finale is going to have eight towers appear in a circle around the arena. These will be represented by thorns, and additionally, the boss is going to drop down two other thorns. The purpose of these is when the boss casts Wreath of Thorns, all of the tanks and healers will be tethered to one of those mystery thorns, and all the DPS target tethered to the other. Everybody gets an arrow orb, meaning that if you're too far away from your tethered thorn, 
it's going to give that twister knockback and it's going to kill some people. So go and spread out near to your thorn. You can use the same relative spread positions you did for act one, or you can have set ones just for this mechanic. But it will always be in the groups tanks and healers and DPS. The reason we spread is because the boss is about to target everyone one at a time with a fleeting impulse AoE. These cause some damage. They give you a pretty long lasting magical vuln up. But most importantly, you need to count which AoE hits you. You might do this by counting aloud, or if you're on voice chat, you can count it for the whole group. Remember this number because after the tethers break, the debuffs fall off. Everyone should go middle and the boss cast Wreath of Thorns and Tethers to each of the Tower Thorns one at a time. This order needs to match the order that we just worked out from the Fleeting Impulse AoEs. This is because you're about to soak a tower, but you need your Magic Voln debuff to have fallen off. So we order ourselves so that we match who got hit first with the first tower that's going to go off, who got hit second with second tower, and so on. As long as you do this, everybody will be able to soak the tower with no problem. If you get the order mixed up, at least one player is going to die because their magic Voln will not have fallen off when they take a tower, and that will kill them. Farsight is, or Nearsight is going to be cast, so position accordingly with your tanks. Heal up through a Searing Stream raid wide. Deal with a demigod double. Be aware if you're having your tanks invuln this, you need to make sure you've swapped aggro by this point in time so your other tank is ready to be able to take this with their invuln. And prepare for the soft and rage mechanic curtain call. As the cast starts, the boss drops down eight thorns. And as soon as the cast finishes, every player is going to get tethered to one of those thorns with a purple orb. These are the purple orbs that mean that if you stretch that tether, a raid wide goes out and you get three seconds of magic full. Our goal is simple. Every player needs to stretch their tether and pop it one at a time, but not too close together that the magic vuln is still up when the next tether breaks. To determine the order, we look at the timer on our debuff. A tank and a DPS will have 12 seconds. Healer and DPS will have 22 seconds. A tank and DPS with 32 and a healer and DPS with 42 seconds. All you have to do is pick one of each roll to go first for each of these timers, and you have your order for popping. In this case, we're having the DPS always pop first. If you're going with this order, the DPS should always be popping their tether right about 10 seconds left on the debuff, and the tanker healer will break their tether when there's about five seconds left on their debuff. Position opposite the or the tower that you're the thorn that you're tethered to, and wait for the timers to appear. As soon as you have them, have your first player go out to break their tether. As the second player goes out to break their tether, the boss is going to start casting Hell's Sting. This is just a combo of conal AoEs. As long as you are in line with your thorn, you should automatically be dodging the first set. There's the second tether, tether breaking. The way Hell's Sting works is first it hits where the AoEs are showing, and then it hits where the first AoEs didn't hit. So, watch where the first were, and now dodge into where was just hit. Afterwards, the third player can break their tether, the fourth player, and so on. We're doing this one at a time, nice and carefully, to make sure that you're not popping it while the magic phone is still up. While the sixth player is tethering, breaking their tether, you're going to get yourself another set of hell stings. Deal with these exactly the same way as before. Dodge the first hit, and then dodge into the second hit. Break your seventh tether, and finally your eighth tether. If you manage to break them all, none of the debuffs have fallen off, and you're all still alive, get to the middle ready for an ultimate impulse raid wide. Heal and mitigate heavily for this, and prepare for your reward for surviving it. The exact same tethers will appear again. You may be tethered to a different thorn, but it's the same principle, the same timers, the same pattern. You just need to go opposite your thorn when your time is ready. After you've dealt with all of these tethers a second time, you get yourself an ultimate impulse raid wide. And finally, one last long ultimate impulse cast that serves as your enrage. If you manage to down the boss before then, congrats, you have cleared the Pandemonium Asphodelus Savage Raid series. Thank you guys so much for watching, and good luck going for the clear.